good evening ladies and gentlemen uh, kindly settle down uh, the chief guest for the evening has already arrived uh, i'll take just a minute or two because uh, a lot of requests has come to me uh, people are cross stuck on the traffic uh, they requested uh, that we can't change the timing but i can take this opportunity to say a few words about what's happening in mma so that you don't miss them i'll say only quickly uh, on the 19th of feb uh, monday we have a event on step to mental well being which we are doing jointly with vedanta and we got irina she will be talking to us on 20th again a very very important topic chennai range helpless hopeless and helpless and we got three outstanding people who are specialists in the field to talk to us what is the solution to avoid flooding in chennai and how we can go forward to come and listen to that and on 23rd feb again we have a as usual read and go and uh, we strongly believe to be a great leader you to be a great reader and we got three outstanding the book what you are going to be discussing many of you would have read it actually many a time is a fascinating book who would my cheese and uh, you learn a lot of management lessons from that again we have three outstanding panelists for that then on 28th of feb again it is a very very important one of the finest event for mma happening over the last so many years mma amalgamation business leadership award and mr enj n chandrashekar chairman tadas sons is being conferred the mma amalgamation business award at the uh, glittering ceremony is happening at taj is only by invitation and uh, already we send it made to all the members uh, you have to register prior registration is mandatory for this please request you do please do the registration you already have more than 350 plus registrations uh, uh, do come it's a fascinating evening besides that we have number of events already lined up in the month of feb march april so do come one major event of march is our women convention uh, it's again uh, most sort of the event and it's a celebration of women what we do it's happening on 16th of march uh, on level up is the theme of the women convention do come come to today's event i think we're all blessed indeed honored uh, to have this event this evening and uh, i am quite sure being a saturday also it's going to be a full house there are so many people are going looking forward to this event indian corporates in the changing global order and to speak on this and share his thoughts which is going to be unique this evening and fascinating and very inspiring ladies and gentlemen put your hand together to welcome the speaker chief guest of the evening mr gurumurthy corporate advisor commentator and economic and finance politics and uh, may i now request uh, the president uh, mma mr mahalingam lakshmi narayanan on the treasurer and uh, uh, mma and mr gurumurthy please take your place on the dais All the viewers watching the program, there's a message for you: is that as usual, if you have any questions, there's a number flat on your screen. You can share your questions with the number. We'll collect all the questions and place it before the distinguished speaker this evening. And he's kindly agreed to respond to all the questions what you're going to ask. And I only request you, please, the questions to be relevant to the theme what we are discussing today. Because the Guru Murthy is fascinating and he's well versed with many subjects. But you don't send it across. We'll place him. He'll take the call whether to respond to the questions or not. Uh, before we move on further, let me have the privilege of uh, requesting Mr. Lakshmi Narayan Duraiswamy, who is the Managing Director of Sundaram Home Finance, and also our Honorable Treasurer, Chairman of Board of Governors of MMA, uh, and he has got over 30 years of experience in finance, specializing in risk management operations, uh, working in GE Capital, a number of other Thomas graduate from under cost accountant and MBA. Uh, now I request Lakshmi Narayan to please deliver the formal welcome. Over to you, Mr. Lakshmi. Good evening, all of you. It's my privilege to deliver the formal welcome address at this very special event of MMA, Indian Corporates in the Changing Global Order, by Mr. S. Guru Murthy. It's indeed an honor to welcome Mr. S. Guru Murthy, corporate advisor and commentator on economics, finance, and politics—a rare mix these days. Sir, we are indeed privileged to have your presence this evening with us, and eagerly looking forward to hearing your. views on on the subject i take this opportunity to welcome all the delegates who have joined us this evening guests and members of mma from all over tamil nadu and pondicherry and guests of partner organizations and the large member of participants from all over the country who have logged in online as most of you are aware mma which was established in 1956 has evolved today as the largest management association in the country with over 8000 members and spread across 10 chapters in tamil nadu and pondicherry 
MMA has been awarded the best management association in the country 14 times a row by the All India Management Association. In the current landscape, external influence on corporate management is quite significant, especially considering the tumultuous geopolitical climate and the government cha governance challenges that we face. It would be enlightening to hear Mr. Gurumurthy's views on Indian corporations and how they face these challenges from an Indian ethos perspective. I also take this opportunity to welcome past presidents of MMA, my colleagues from the management committee, members of MMA, distinguished invitees from corporates and other organizations, management students and members who have joined, uh, joined MMA from online all over the world. And, and through fa YouTube, Facebook, MMA live webinar and also those who are listening to, listening it through the MMA radio voice of MMA. Wish you all a, a happy evening with the knowledge and inspiration for all of you and have a good evening and we look forward to this engaging uh, conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lashmi Narayanan. Mr. Mahalingam, uh, Mr. Mahalingam is a chemical engineer from NIT Trichy and uh, is a postgraduate holder. Second is a distinguished alumni of, uh, with over 35 years of experience uh, and uh, is also leading T.S. Mahalingam from India, leading automobile aftermarket brand in South India. And Mahalingam is the president of MMA. Uh, now I request Mr. Mahalingam to please deliver the formal uh, introductory <coughs> remarks and he also introduce the speaker. Over to you, Thank you, Vijay. Good evening, everybody. I must confess that introducing such an eminent person like Sri Gurumurthy and experiencing contrasting emotions. On one side, I am extremely proud and excited and honored to have the opportunity to do this. On the other side, I am very nervous and very worried that I might miss out some aspects of this multifaceted personality that Mr. Sri Gurumurthy is. Let me try though. Child accountant, pioneering investigative journalist, editor, corporate and legal advisor, thought leader in economic and strategic affairs, vice chairman of the Vivekananda Foundation, visiting professor of business and management IIT Bombay and much, much more. I'm sure I've left out a bit. Apologies if I have. Beyond all that, I think the basis of all this and to top it all is Sri Gurumurthy, without doubt, is one of the sharpest minds in the country on multiple matters. We are indeed very honored and fortunate to have you, sir. When the office bearers of, for this year were elected, and uh, I had a message, I was very thrilled to get a message from Guru Murthy congratulating me on becoming president. So I called back to thank him, and his immediate question was, all that's fine, so what are you planning for MMA? So to which I said the usual thing, we're going to do some, we'll have three conventions, uh, we'll have uh, eminent speakers, nice sessions, etc. All that is fine. He said, now next what? He, then he said, what are you going to do to create a sustaining impact on management thinking in this country and the city? He said, MMA is in a unique position to do that. I think there's a big opportunity to do that. I said, okay. You know, then I decided uh, that this discussion would not go further without meeting him in person. So I sought an appointment and went there. And believe me, over the next two to three months, uh, Group Captain Vijay Kumar, Shankar, our senior vice president, me and Lakshmi Narayan visited him in his office twice. I'm telling you, each one of those was a master class. He used to reel out facts, details, he used to talk about world history, Indian culture, Indian approach to people and management, Western practices, Western capital raising models, very cap Western capital structures. He would be dazzled. And everything, every time he came back, learning a lot more. And I should be doing what I did the day, listening rather than speaking. But I have to do this, I'm doing this. So at the end of it, 
uh, we kind of arrived at a topic. His suggestion was what we have today, uh, Indian corporates in the changing uh, world order. He was of the view that we have to introduce management thinking and practices in this city and country which are more in tune with local culture, local relationship focus and local realities. We won't believe it, he sent us a synopsis uh, which is so exhaustive. Uh, it was like for me reading a thesis paper in college back, I can tell you. That's the kind of effort that has gone into it. What he did was he kind of traced the history of the world uh, where it started with uh, West one size fits all approach where all of us, especially those with a colonial uh, past, were following Western practices almost blindly. And he said that happened between, he, he quotes a 1951 paper in which the world believed, the West believed that local practices, local cultures had to be virtually destroyed for proficiency and uh, efficiency to happen. That started changing in his view between 2005 and 15 after the dot-com bust and the uh, like Asian crisis that the one-size-fits-all approach started getting questioned. Started changing rapidly towards the later half of the decade and by 2019, uh, the post-pandemic, what happened was a West-led growth model was getting questioned and virtually over with. So he traces this beautifully and then goes on to say, what's in it for India and, uh, and Indian businesses? That's going to be my thought, the uh, bulk of what he's going to talk about. I'm sure he has a lot more to say and a lot more things, but I think he's going to talk about what's in it for India and or for Indian businesses. Uh, I'm, as I said, I'm, I should not be talking, I should be listening. I think all of us are waiting to listen to him. My observation, my deep admiration of the fact that uh, Mr. Gurumuthi has numbers on the top of his mind, chooses his words so beautifully, so in many ways he makes every word count. I think we should weigh every word he says with a lot of importance and take away today. He said this should not be a one-off speech. He wants people and corporates who are invited here today to absorb what is there, internalize, and maybe uh, validate their company process in that light. And as he said, this should be a moment and not a one-off event. So that is the spirit of this event uh, which you have imbibed from Mr. Gurumurthy. Take this process of Indian management thinking, local management thinking, and make sure it is customized. Actually, he also mentioned during our conversations, he has advised leading corporate, really large corporate on this idea and they've seen excellent results uh, following this model and he said some of them are already following that model. So there's so much to learn from Sri Guru Murthy. We are really honored, excited to have you sir. Thank you so much. Looking forward to your speech. Mr. Mali, Mr. Lakshmanarayan, and uh, so many friends of mine who are here, and dear brothers and sisters, namaskarams to all. You know, when they came and discussed with me, I had quite a lot of things to tell them, which is far too heavy for the contemporary discourse. Today, you want things which will be useful for the day, tomorrow, day after. The world has got so short-termist in character. Previously, we used to think of a decade's growth. After five years, what will happen? Next year's situation. Everything got reduced to quarterly results. And now nations' moods are decided by overnight interest rates. You can understand the short-termist approach which is now sweeping the world. And this one of my studies, why China is rising and US is declining. 
In 2011, strategic thinkers in U.S. began studying declinism of U.S. Declinism of U.S. is because the U.S. was a new country and succeeded. Had it been a country with uh, baggages, like us, like other countries, it would have faced the same problem which we are facing. It did not face any of those problems, so it created new problems for itself, which it did not solve, and its problems it universalized for others also. So we are a country with a blackboard on which there is so many scribblings for the last 5,000 years. Some are good, some are bad. Some are relevant, some are actually bad for today and tomorrow. You know, this kind of objective assessment about ourselves has been lacking so much in our society. And the most tragic thing is that we know very little about ourselves. This has been my finding in the last 40 years of my understanding of uh, this country and the world from different perspectives, from business, of course, finance, and everything associated with that, corporate economics to national and global economics, journalism, politics, philosophy, social practices. From all perspective, I had an opportunity to study. It's not by own effort. It is from one accident to other, which gave me access to knowledge about different dimensions of uh, national and global life. You know, I will start with what was my experience in London in 1986, when I was a fairly well-known corporate advisor in India, and I had been invited by one of the most important uh, NRIs at that time, uh, Suraj Park. He had called me for some discussions. So when I landed, of course, I had gone today to return with the uh, with, with business class ticket for tomorrow. I had only one day's discussion. So I was crossing the immigration. They asked, why have you come here for? They said, come because I am a, a consultant, corporate consultant. And I gave my credentials and also the invitation letter from Suraj Park. And the fellows are standing there to receive me. Every Indian says this. Because that was my first understanding about how Indians are viewed by the white man. So, sir, I may be, but I am really going back. What is the guarantee you will go back? I said, I have my return ticket in British Airways, in business club. Ah, that's what everybody says. You can always come with the ticket. I said, what are you saying? You mean to say I am going to stay here? That is the last desire I have to leave my country and be here. Since you are so offensive to me, I am not going to enter your country. Please prepone my ticket and send me back. He was shocked. Because he has not seen any Indian responding like that. Then he didn't know what to do. He said, sir, sir, I am sorry. I said, I want a return apology. I will not settle unless you get a return apology because you have not defamed me, you have defamed my country. Of course, afterwards, some discussion, some senior came and I settled for an oral apology by the topmost person present there. This opened a new understanding about how others view us. This is a very important lesson. This is what opened me to think about the world, not from a very narrow perspective of business, profit, investment. Something far more is needed. So with this, I began studying very deeply about India, about the world, about the different economic, trade, commercial practices. And my ideas became more macro than micro. In fact, that was very helpful to me, even in my micro-professional practice, because there is no divorce between the micro and the macro. 
so far as the intellectual understanding of what we are advising our client is concerned that actually improved my standing with my client because i was not talking only about one i was talking about 10 and each had its importance a eh, about what we were discussing so my mind was open to challenges issue problems which this country is facing which this country is not handling the media is not handling the political leadership is not handling intellectualism academics all have failed this was the first understanding i had in fact this i have been writing speaking in fact when i was when i spoke in iit in 2010 that's one of the speeches which uh, if you have time you must listen that was uh, shailendra mehta institute of management they had called me to deliver a lecture and i delivered the lecture afterwards all the students and the faculties came and said sir we know nothing about what you are talking iit which is supposed to be the window of india to the world and the world's perspective about india is being developed by such high end educational institutions they confess they knew nothing about what i was saying about india not in the context of philosophy culture in the context of economics in the context of entrepreneurial development in the context of how india is developing they didn't even see the nexus between indian development and india they related it to fii's putting money into india that's how the the entire americans american thinking failed in china because they thought it was their money which was developing china no their the money was developing china to develop in the chinese way but our intellectualism our experts our political thinkers our bureaucrats our economists never thought we are developing because we have something in us this my perspective i acquired when i started traveling across the country i my first lesson was in ludhiana ludhiana batala rajkot jamnagar morbi right down to thootupudi i travel 42 industrial clusters and i found something very different happening in those places which you will not find in economic time or business line or in the researches or the studies about india this is what i spoke in the iit they said sir we know nothing about these things and so they asked me to uh conduct a course for them which i did for four years and i asked the iit students only one thing don't attend campus in okay. this actually sapping your energy and buying you for money you know you will be surprised no it was a fulfillment of my life after five years when i went to indore two young men came and touched my feet and sir you advised us not to go for campus interviews today we are running a business which is an improvement of their family business which is a small trading business sir we are running a company which employs 1200 people two young men that is the potentiality of india and i found in the course of my entire understanding about indian economy indian industry indian commercial practices entrepreneurship that most of the employees in india are educated and most of the entrepreneurs are uneducated you know tirupur tirupur is probably the knitwear export capital of the world today their export almost touches 7 to 8 billion dollars 67% of the exporters are educated less than 10th standard only 7% are graduates out of the five top diamond exporters three are educated only up to 5th standard your education has nothing to do with entrepreneurship so from this perspective i have to talk to you this is the micro ground level study but i have to take you to another level helicopter view and then bring you down to understand what institutions like mma can do and should do and if they fail to do they will be only doing holding operation 
there are two india in the perspective of the world and in our own perspective i don't know how many of you heard about max weber he is supposed to be the conceptualist of the modern world the modern west owes its entire philosophic and practical background to max weber max weber said only if you have this protestant christian values you can develop a market economy and he was right because all the catholic nations were lagging behind and all the protestant nations were moving up even within christendom so he was right because he had studied that society for 30 years but he didn't study this society our society china and india but he wrote a book the religion of hinduism and another book religion of buddhism and he said these two societies will never come up in modern economy because they believe in karma and rebirth you believe you believe in karma and rebirth you don't have the capacity to develop risk bearing tendencies you leave everything to fate such a superficial view of india this is what max weber wrote 1897 or 1900 he wrote this book which was published in india somewhere in 1950s and that became the bible for the indian sociologists indian development thinkers indian government indian policy makers before that in 1853 karl marx wrote a couple of articles in howard uh, new york this uh, new uh, new uh, New York Herald Trib- uh, Review, which is now International Herald Tribune, in which he said, of course, India is some kind of a primitive socialist society, but this society has a very big problem that it has not changed for the last two two thousand years. Stagnant, what we call a stable, he called it a stagnant, and he said this is a society which worships cow. <laughs> and monkeys how can this semi barbaric society develop and is it the british are doing the right thing by destroying this society its economy its trade its education it's very painful he quoted goethe to say it's a very painful destruction but there is a pleasurable part of it also that is how india would be prepared for revolution karl marx and max weber were the intellectual masters of india and in a sense for the world also then came this is how the, these people cannot grow one one is you are disqualified for development you are qualified for development only if you cease to be yourself this is karl marx so india was growing at 3% or 1% 4% so in 1978 professor raj krishna who was a socialist economic thinker and was an advisor to the government of india also he was asked sir we are following the same socialist policies which the east european country which russia and other countries are following but they are growing at 55% 6% 7% we are growing only at 3% sir what is the cost he said whatever policies you follow we will have only hindu rate of growth that is how the word hindu rate of growth came into our discord it has become part of our dictionary it has become part of our psyche it has become part of public discourse it has become the brand of india you know robert mcnamara this happened in 1978 robert mcnamara began begging the world here is a society which is a burden on the world i am begging for assistance for the poor people of india aid india consortium was formed this was the brand of india in 1980 81 this is the perspective which dominated us this is how we understood india it is not that it is how they understood india this is how we began understanding india this is one perspective of the west about india and i am going to give you another perspective of the same west about india that of scientists and historians you will be amazed 
at the contract and how sorry because in the last minute i couldn't i am talking about what scientists said about this not ordinary scientists nobel laureates what did they say about india not now in 1930s 1920s at a conversation about indian philosophy some of the ideas of quantum physics that seems so crazy suddenly made much more sense werner heisenberg nobel science prize winner some blood transfusion from the east to the west is a must to, to save the western science vedanta teaches that consciousness is singular all happenings are played out in one universal consciousness and there is no multiplicity of self erwin schrodinger astrian physicist the father of quantum physics nobel prize winner for innovation in wave mechanics in all the world there is no kind of framework within which we can find consciousness in the plural this is simply something which we construct because of the temporal plurality of individuals but this is a false construction there is only one solution to this conflict so far as any is available to all of us and that lies in the ancient wisdom of upanishad shodinger i go into upanishad to ask questions niels bohr the bohr model of atom inventor nuclear physicist nobel prize winner for physics in 1922 vedanta and sankhya hold the key to the laws of mind and thought process which are correlated in the quantum field that is the operation and distribution of particles at an atomic and molecular levels brian david josephson welsh physicist the youngest nobel laureate i can keep on quoting 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 you must have heard about robert oppenheimer who was the father of the atom bomb he must have been wandering around chennai some time back in such a truth these are all the people who spoke about india and then i will quote you what two greatest historians spoke about it it is true that is will durant he stated it in 1935 it is true that even across the human barrier india has sent to us such questionable gifts as grammar and logic philosophy and tables hypnotism and chess and above all the numerals and our decimal system but these are not the essentials of our spirit but they are trifles compared to what we can learn from her in future perhaps in turn for the conquest arrogance and spoliation india will teach us the tolerance of the gentleness of mind the quiet content of the acquisitive soul the calmness of understanding spirit and unifying and pacifying love of all living things love of all living things is important because i am going to demonstrate to you you will be amazed the indian government was shocked when certain things were told to them that's what i'm going to tell you at the end then toyn b it is already becoming clear that a chapter which had western beginnings will have to have an indian ending if it is not to end in destruction of the human race all on, on at this supremely dangerous moment in human history the only way of salvation is the ancient hindu way and we have an attitude here we have an attitude and spirit that can make it possible for the human race to grow into a single family this is another perspective which we do not even know it is the sociologists and economists who presented india in such a manner that no indian will feel proud and every indian will feel ashamed scientists and historians who are not contextualized a historian is not contextualized by today he sees it from a perspective of 200 years back and 100 years forward 
their perspective is different they see india as guiding the world the scientists say that things which are not clear to science is clear in the ancient vedas and upanishad this our students have not heard our academics have not heard our policy makers have not heard the media doesn't know certainly not mma <laughs> unless you understand it how do you understand india now i will take you to where we are talking about world order where did this world order begin order means there is a system there is a leader there is a governance model there are rules and regulations behavioral then punishment there is an institution all this was conceived after the second world war the united nations was constituted the undeclared and later declared leader of this whole order was us it's important to know that the report of the expert committee this is the source of all the problems of india and all the non western nations what i am going to read out to you this is clearly the encapsulation and formalization of what karl marx and max weber said this is a report of the Esco expert committee of united nations measures one for the development of underdeveloped nations of course a huge document and if you read more you will be so pained so i am reading out the least painful part but the most instructive part of the report there is a sense in which rapid economic progress is impossible without painful adjustments ancient philosophies have to be scrapped precisely what max weber said precisely what karl marx said old social institutions have to disintegrate i will explain the meaning of it there should be no relationship of any kind we should all become atomized individuals bound only by contract law courts government this is western anthropological modernity bonds of caste creed and race have to burst and then comes the warning and large number of persons who cannot keep up with practice keep up with progress have to have their expectations of a comfortable life prestige very few communities are willing to pay the price for rapid economic progress this was a global advisory for all developed nations our is officers our is of ifs officers our academic institutions our academics our media were evangelized into this if you are what you are you can never develop you have to cease to be what you are to develop this has been ingrained in the indian psyche indian public discourse and i will let you as you are getting release from this psychological bond we are developing it is not that we are developing and so we are giving it up actually india is moving away from this kind of intellectually oppressive thoughts that is what i am going to tell you now so we followed the sociologists and econ econ economists and we ignored historians and scientists and thought that we were semi barbaric race we have to be turned into modern nation by western understanding of ourselves this is how we began to perceive ourselves this was 1951 1990 at least they told us this is how you develop in 1990 when globalization came we accepted yes you are right our own entire country why the entire world accepted the west is the best because francis fukuyama wrote a book the book was called the end of history and the lost man and that is supposed to be the bible of globalization he said that finally the west has won against the rest the liberal democracy and market capitalism have become the final victors 
and it is the best for the rest to follow the west as the best that was the simple formulation he made the whole world accepted it and the west itself began believing him the problem is when you begin believing you are the victor and all of us are losers there's something seriously wrong with you in history there is no perpetual victor in history is what history teaches the whole world the west believed it has become final victor and i don't want to go more into how they began to feel that they are the, they are much more powerful modern intellectual and uh, uh, military power and they began extending the nakut nato and see what happened today you may be surprised to know russia is on the verge of victory in ukraine whole world was lured into believing the western way is the best way and the west itself began declaring it's a what man he dissent is it is all foolish because civilization consciousness is so deep in human mind and indian age there will be civilizational clashes in the world you cannot ignore it and that was samuel huntington he was dismissed to pillory he was called as someone who will destroy the liberal world but when the 2001 terror attack took place everybody silently accepted that there is something of huntington in the global strategic discourse because this is i am part of a huge strategic community at the head of course i was introduced as the vice chairman of bekar and the international foundation that was till 2018 after which i became the chairman so i deal with the strategic community at various level global level local level so how the global strategic thinking shifts from time to time i am very familiar with so this clash between globalization and civilizational rise has been going on without the world noticing it and certainly we did not notice it and in 2008 when the financial collapse took place then everyone in the west knew the western financial model is not sustainable but they cannot say it because if they say it it will collapse tomorrow keep the show going i will give you evidence of it in end june 1989 the economist magazine came out with a cover story the modern economics is melting away what's wrong with economics you must read the editorial it said that the economists became more powerful than politicians and alan greenspan if he died today he must be still put on the uh, us federal reserve chief chair with the dark glasses so that no one knows he is a dead figure sitting there because he is so important for the world he ruled the world for 20 years no american president ruled for more than 8 years us federal reserve was the most permanent institution which decided the fate of all economies in fact when alan greenspan said in 1993 that japanese economy is showing irrational exuberance the japanese stock market fell by 3% that was the towering influence they controlled the world after 2008 it became to this one size fit all model was openly questioned in the 2008 i am going to give you three four dates in 2005 the g20 met in beijing where for the first time because of china's influence because china was rising and china could not be ignored in 2005 china said <coughs> that every country will have to have its own development model there cannot be a universal one size fit all model it became the official resolution of the finance ministers and central bank governors of g20 nations in 2005 i don't think our newspapers even published it in 2008 the world bank said in its newsletter that we were the ones who believed that the whole world can be corrected on the basis of one size fit all model we have learned the hard way that 
not workable. Each country will have to work out its own model. And then came in 2010, the United Nations, and then 2013 and 2014, the UNGA also discussed and they said this one size fit all model should be thrown over lock, stock and barrel. Not a single word in Indian media, Indian public discourse, among Indian academics. Certainly not the government. It was only in 2015. On the 2nd of January 2015 when the Niti Ayog was created, the Prime Minister insisted on putting four sentences. He said we will follow only what works in and for India. You can, you can see this quote is a beautiful resolution. I don't know whether Niti Ayog read it. Second was that we need a Bharatiya model for development. I don't think this was even discussed in the media. Not even criticized. They ignored. Why I am saying this is that this one size fit all model has been consigned in macroeconomics, in finance, certainly in politics. The West used to criticize us that you are not a liberal economy. You are a liberal democracy. You are a third-rate democracy. But they found that liberal democracy constitutes only 12% of the global population. So they are holding India's hands so that democracies can reach a respectable figure of 30%. The world needs India. They were certifying Rating our economies, that they were rating the economy and our security. So, the, with the rise of Asia and later the rise of India, for reasons the West is not fathoming even today, why is India rising, they don't know. They are certainly clear it is not because of FIA flow. There is something more to it. So, In this situation, the declinism of America and of the West, coupled with the rise of Asia, this created a new debate, which I mentioned to Mali, that the world began understanding the difference between what is market economics and market society. This is one of the things all of you must begin discoursing because it is very important for macroeconomics as well as for corporate economics. Market economics is that market goods and goods are bought and sold, services, price is determined, interest rates are determined somewhere. But in market society, that happens inside the house. Human beings become merely uh, playthings. But beautiful explanations are given as to what is a market society. That you lend your forehead for one month to be painted by Coca-Cola, for which you will get $1,200. But if you permanently make it a mark, you will get $25,000. You will wear this and go around. People are willing to. This is market society. Yeah. Human beings losing everything just in pursuit of money and pleasure. They said Asia is rising because it is not a market society. West is declining because it has become a market society. Family is destroyed, community is destroyed, relationship is destroyed, which I will go into later. So, this was understood and it is in this context between 2020 and now, how the whole world order is standing on its head. When the, you know, Supply chains, and you know, I used to discuss with, uh, with uh, my friends who were in government, even in UPA time, some of the good friends. In fact, I had very fruitful interaction with even Pranam Mukherjee at that time. It was very difficult for him even to meet me, we met secretly. Mm -hmm. So, I said the way we are going about this global supply chain, all this is not going to work unless you have a global government, global army, global leader. 
it's not possible it's not going to work let the whole world and suddenly not india get adjusted to global supply chain i was the lone dissenter in fact in 1995 when i addressed the um, administrative staff college of india in calcutta in calcutta in, in hyderabad when i was explaining how globalization is not sustainable one person stood up and said people like you must be shot dead because you are taking the country 500 years back that is the extent of the pressure of public opinion that has been built by such intense evangelization in 200 years mercantile capitalism was finished in 100 years communism is finished in 100 years capitalism is finished in 50 years communism is finished in 20 years global in 25 years globalization is over the shelf life of all the ideas which governed the world have crashed because they were all based on one size and the western size and the western leadership dominating the world and that came to be completely questioned in 2020 when the pandemic came no one knew how to handle it no one ever thought india would handle it there were estimates some 30 crore people will be infected and 3 crore people will die in one year all over the world in our own country but we decided no we will make our vaccine everybody thought narendra modi was a madman but he had the capacity he understood that the country has the capacity <coughs> with this result when we came out with our vaccine we even supplied vaccine to the world the world looked at india it had nothing to do with the fii investment understand this it has nothing to do with the fdi it had nothing to do with our english education it had nothing to do with the media it had to do with the potentiality of indians day and night people worked and the prime minister was on phone with them do it do it do it this is faith plus promotion is changing the perception of the world about india and not so much about india in the mind of the indians itself No, 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 no! This you don't go for the vaccine. This is the kind of political propaganda which was going on. Even BJP vaccine would have been more acceptable. They called it Modi vaccine. <laughs> you know, such negativity had come into our public discourse. <coughs> World understood that something is happening in India. Something very different is happening in India. at that time the man who fashioned the world world order henry kissinger he wrote a 625 word article in his blog in which he said the world order will change forever there is no other explanation this was like opposition statement world was shaken the man who conceptualized constructed built and evangelized the even china into that world order said the world order will change forever then everybody began discussing world order will change world order will change because the core of the american success was to turn china into a dirty factory of the world put so much money in china the chinese will become prosperous and a prosperous society will never accept communism you see it is like touching the uh knows from behind and this is a great intellectual uh exercise that was started in 1993 if i remember right in bill clinton's regime when bill clinton began engaging china after the tiananmen square attack without any kind of remorse from china it raised the frankenstein monster and kept it at our border we have 5000 km border with us if america had 5000 km border with china would have taken that risk 
if china had if america had 500 kilometers border with afghanistan with pakistan would they take that risk 6000 miles away you are so safe and you plan you lay the rules for the rest to follow please understand how much intellectual inadequacy we must have had not understanding the geographical political geopolitical economic technological educational difference between america and the rest of the world and us in 2022 when russia attacked ukraine the world did not know what is happening and america russia thought it is a one month game we will wipe out they made initial mistakes but they could not but have done it if they had not attacked ukraine in 10 years there will be no russia no country can take the bridge even american strategic thinkers accepted even kissinger said this not a risk that russia could have accepted you were expanding nato nato into the mouth of into the stomach of uh, russia at that time the prime minister did not have much time to decide maybe he had a couple of hours to decide to stand neutral between russia and america which means favoring russia i mean america even thought of sanctions america will immediately think of sanctions only in 1998 they did and there is a beautiful scholarly work done by the by australian think tank every sanction has been a failure in the world except that it is a propaganda in fact when the sanctions took place abdul kalam told me she so would you please see the sanction continue for another 4 5 years drdo will develop even further <laughs> you know please the sanctions do it is the intellectuals who feel sanctions are bad scientists do not politicians fear technocrats do not so america even thought of sanctions but if the prime minister had not taken or india had not taken the decision the oil prices would have hit 150 160 200 when india took the decision the entire oil producing countries felt that we should not get into the game of high oil prices because unreasonable oil prices will destroy the oil producing countries themselves in future because they want to move out of oil production in the next 5 years in the next 50 years because of environmental consideration they don't consider oil as a permanent thing and the unreasonable rise in oil prices is going to make them think twice and so what happened oil prices went up to 120 it began crashing and it is now normal and we are buying oil from russia refining it and exporting it to europe so it is washed the, the sins of russian oil are washed in the ganges of the indian refinery america doesn't know what to do this is the change in the world order the world order is that there is no hegemonic power today the center for foresight of the european union it's a very important study you can go to the european union website and see how the world order is changing it is called center for foresight it says that in the next 5 years all middle powers will rise by 2030 there will be no hegemonic power this is the shift in the world order and now what is happening in india india's too has changed when india exploded the pokhran atom bomb everybody thought what's happening in india bill clinton said a country of gandhi and buddha have done this we were always the gandhi we can land the buddha and gandhi how did it get 
the moment we exploded the poker and atom bomb the world began to deal with us negotiate with us engage with us the world respects power the indians did not understand because we are always a civilizational conflict between power and our value this is happening from vedic days and it is only chanakya who shifted it it's a huge topic i don't want to impose you on this and you will be surprised to know that the reason pakistan government's website containing the history and culture of pakistan i read the interaction between alexander and kautilya how kautilya's mind changed he was teaching in in takshashila university and when he found that there will be unreasonable adharmic wars people with big armies will conquer us we need a stable army we need a stable government we need resources he began conceiving a state and he shifted the mind of india from merely defensive posturing to offensive posturing and we built 800 years we built big empires and then came one thinker by name barnabas kautilya they say he is from kerala this banabatta is from uh, bihar the same place from where buddha originated and he said this hello is an adharmi he is promoting what is known as acquisitive war that's not our war system our war is that we should not conquer others we should not destroy others we should even if we conquer and win we will have to hand over the kingdom back to the defeated person this is our dharma and he is now destroying all this and creating violence in the society you know what happened the entire arthashastra books disappeared all over india and only one copy escaped in tanjore and that was handed over to mysore maharaja library in 1907 and that was translated into english in 1913 and that is what we have today and because we delegitimized the kautilya in 500 years we lost our entire freedom this is how the indian mind always was in conflict between how to handle power if you create power it will not you know even now in many family they won't keep weapons don't keep weapons because in a mood you may use them but in america 33 crore americans have 39 crore guns you can understand me <laughs> what can happen to that society on that basis so india changed in 1998 2014 and now everyone says india has changed the world has changed india has changed but what is its impact on indian businessmen indian entrepreneurs academics professionals and management unless you view it in this perspective that is why i went to q in a helicopter travel and i have come to what be as people operating in specific areas should do first we must know about india most people do not know about india this is it. and this is like you know newton's falling apple facts not being noticed in fact when i was talking to the prime minister that is how it originated i also said to the lecture which i delivered on the places to be niti ayo i will capture in two two three minutes and then i will tell you you i that will open your mind about what is india in the context in the current context and how it is going to be the solution for the world in future no the india landscape is just 2.4% of the global land area this also may be we have 80% of world's human population 30% of world's bovine population 40% of world's cattle population 8% of world's and animals and we have 21% forest coverage you tell this the world will be shaken our bovine population is 535 million and that of america 89 million that of china 90 million only brazil comes somewhere half of us 
235 million. You know why? It is because we use our agricultural land for crop production. We have world's one percent world's agricultural land in this entire space. Only 10.3 percent is farmland, out of which 2.4 percent is used. Less than one fourth is used for crop production. The balance is used for meat production. Crops give you 83 percent of the calorie value, and meat gives only 17 percent of the calorie value. And crop gives thirty-seven percent of the. All this I explained to the prime minister. Crop gives thirty, sixty-three percent of the protein value, and meat gives thirty-seven percent. Meat to crop CO two gas emission. If crop emits one percent CO two, meat extraction is. Ten to hundred percent. In fact, in the Paris Earth Summit, they wanted one day meat-free holiday to be declared. That would have been the solution for the world's environmental problems, global warming problem. Now nobody talks about environment or ecology. Nobody even talks about Global warming. They are all talking about 1.5 degrees. It is all reduced. Like economics has been reduced, econometrics. Now it has been reduced to a degree. Nobody talks about environment because the West cannot talk about environment at all. The amount of CO2 gas emission they have pumped in the last 300 years is 90 percent. This is a permanent damage. CO2 gas emission is a permanent damage to the atmosphere. Ninety percent of the CO2 gas emission that has been put into the atmosphere is by the Western model of development. Having done that, they say we are going back. So this is the environmental debate in which it's all supply side discourse. I am going to talk about the demand side, the lifestyle. So now, <clears throat> because of this, we are able to feed. 140 million people with 1% of global land area because we are able to extract 83% of the calories 37% of the uh protein from that and our meat consumption is 3.1 kg per head per annum americas is 124 that of europe is something like 110 or 120 of south africa 180 Japan, which was having as close to us in 1950, because of the Western culture, their meat consumption has shot up to 49 kg, almost equal in China. A month back, an, a well-known ecologist wrote a gave an interview in Times of India. I don't know whether you read it. First page flap, half flap. World is being warmed up by everybody. The only country which is mitigating it is India through vegetarians. It's not that we don't eat non-vegetarian. We eat non-vegetarian, but it's a subtle part. Our food habits have been conceived like this. Is it by accident? It is by a philosophy. It is by a working model. It is not that non-vegetarians are bad. There is a stage at which people even give up non-vegetarian. For example, people do not eat non-vegetarian on On Yakadashi, or Amavasya, or Friday, or Saturday, these are all restraint on us that we should not kill for pleasure. With the result, India has been able to maintain its population by an accultured food habit. This was the position even in 1960 when we did not have. You go into statistics, an amazing revelation. That in 1960s, when we did not have food, cattle population kept rising. We never thought it is only for it. So when we said one earth, one family, and when Arnold Toynbee said that it is for the, all the living being, 
there is an environmentally compatible lifestyle this is what the prime minister's g20 message of course it's much more as to tell you simply if all american ship to uh, if all indian ship to mcdonald and burger you know what is the calculation we will need six times the agricultural land we have we will need two and a half times the size of india if the whole world shifts to the american way of eating we will need 40% more agricultural land than the world has if the world shifts to the indian way of eating it will need only 40% of the agricultural land it uses you want to get all this data you can access ourworldindata.com so we have a model for the world for the future unless we understand it what will you think about india india is a country of future not for itself for the whole world environmental paradigm is now sweeping the world and the only answer is through lifestyle it cannot be through controlling how much power you produce and how much fossil fuel you use unless you create a restrained lifestyle for which there is a working model it is not in libraries or in dead books living model you know this culture prevails you know what is the meat consumption in bangladesh you will be surprised it's 100% almost 100% this country 94% or so same as india culture is the same but we don't want to even talk about it how damaged is our intellect how much a deficit is there in our public discourse so first know something about india now more specifically we have to think as indians at least now let us begin thinking about indians because indians are respected everywhere because you are not respected there you are not respecting yourself you are not respecting the country you are not respecting your forefathers you are not respecting your philosophy now the reverse is happening so as i mentioned we are a market economy and not a market society and i have advised many many corporates that in india buying is not an individual decision it's a family decision there are many many researches about it. the family collectively decides it orders it is not that an individual may buy some pen or something like that but when it comes to a substantial buying it's a market economy and not a market society there is a difference between the two for example take indian lifestyle we have 4.9% per household in india in america it is 2.5 in america it was 3 in 1960 it has come down to 2.5 the result of this reduction in 5 is construction of 35 million more houses at a cost of 8.5 trillion dollars i am not going into the environmental cost in india if the number of persons reduced from 4.9 to 2.5 we will need 135 million more houses there will be no place in india accommodating others relation based lifestyle taking care of elders taking care of informed people this has nothing to do with economics gentlemen this has nothing to do with law this has nothing to do with indian laws in india there is no law requiring you to take care of your family uh, parents but it is happening because it is happening our economy is functioning and in america they handle all the responsibilities of maintaining the parents the grandparents people who are dependent on them they have to given to the care of the state even the children are not educated if a child is there with the father beyond the age of 14 are you still with your father it's a humiliation to be with the parent that is the extent to which relationship have been destroyed with the result America went on the paradigm of universal social security the universal social security was initially giving money and now there is more withdrawals because 
the baby boomers have lost america is not replacing its population with the result more withdrawals are there the deficit started in 2006 and now they say the present value of the future social security is 72 trillion dollars which is three times the american gdp but in india it is so culturally arranged Ninety percent of the parents are being taken care of, except ten percent who have gone abroad. They have not taken care of their parents. That is a social overseeing. A man will not be respected if he doesn't take care of the parents. This is the impact of culture and society on economics, on macroeconomics. If all Indians, earning Indians, decide to disown their responsibilities to their parents, to the near and dear, sixty, seventy crore Indians will be standing before the government of India for two square meals a day. Where there will be government or public order or economics or market or stock market. This is a model for the world. It is because we are not a contract-based society. Now we are reducing everything into a contract. Marriage has been reduced into a contract. Father and son relationship is a contract. With the neighbors, you have a moral obligation. In 1994, in Chennai, one of my friends, he was driving to uh, State Bank of India. He had a meeting to settle some of his problem. But the neighbor, neighbor's wife came and said, "My son, uh, husband is having chest pain. He has to be taken to the hospital." He just went in, put the man, went to the hospital. His bank appointment went up in spoke. Five years the man suffered. So once I was discussing with him, I asked him, "What do you feel about that incident, Guru? I can tell you one thing. If I had gone for the bank appointment, if something had happened to that man, I would never have lived in peace throughout my life. That is India." In America, nobody will bother about it. In America, if a person dies, the husband dies, or wife dies, or father dies, or till the mortuary van comes, you will be sitting with a dead body alone. But in India, for a marriage, you have got to go and invite people to come. For a death, they have to come themselves. You know what the philosophy? To share your sorrow, others have to come uninvited. to share your pleasure you have to go and invite people this is how the society is built so this is contract based society versus relation based society this has a huge impact on your own company i have advised to many corporates that you must build a relation based culture even at the cost of efficiency efficiency will give you immediate returns loyalty will give you long term returns so i have told them that the promoter should go to the top vertical managers houses at least once a year see what is happening he may have a spastic child and he wears pack coat and all that he comes and sits in the meeting he doesn't know what he, what what he needs mind you don't know you don't know the man you only is this and the vertical manager should go to Ten people below them. The whole organization must be linked by personal touch. There will be no attrition at higher level. Once you know your self manager has this problem, the way you look at him will be very different. This is relation based. You have to apply the Western model of HR. to suit indian conditions i am not saying you should not have contracts but we don't function only on contracts how many of you as managers as we say to sack a person only on contract we don't but we don't legitimize it third thing is one of the most important thing that is happening i have pleaded with cii asocham fiki and i have told mali also in fact the cii people came and sat with me i said there is complete divergence between agency capitalism of the west and the promoter capitalism of india 
putting it for short of words i'm using simple sentences agency capitalism means the shareholders are represented by agents funds and things like that. and the company is managed by agents who are ceo both sides one doesn't own capital the other doesn't represent the capital with results a huge amount of fraud all these things is happening because nobody has any stake this is lack of shareholder oversight this is what this for shareholders oversight they have conceived the governance plot we have copied it but here there is shareholder oversight the promoter oversight is there the government has 100 provisions on your neck which is not there in america government has no role government can order investigation they can sack you they can appoint government directors how can you transplant the same corporate governance model in india i pleaded with chartered account everyone does the copy pasting of template pasting of what is happening in sec in india and it is endlessly happening no one is raising the voice i have made at least 10 important notes and given to all these people nothing is happening so there is no double agency capitalism in india there is a owner having capital 97.5% of the indian corporates are family managed and your entire management education system is against family management and these are the people to work under people who are promoter led company in promoter led company see how much the, the, the manager is thinking is a fool because he is having shares he is sitting over me this is the psychology with which he is handling the promoter let us come to terms with the indian reality so our economy is promoter led their economy is promoter less a paradigm difference but that is not reflected in your capital uh, in your in your sebi rules or even i mean when yashwan sinha was uh, piloting that uh, independent directors because there are the five six pages of what should be the qualification i said these are the qualification which is needed for a realized soul not not for independent directors what is it you are doing you are idealizing a business which is not ideal robust thinking is needed in the corporate sector in management institute in professional institute on all these important areas we need to study every aspect in which we deal with the world with indian perspective it is very important because the world would like to know how indian corporates function just when japan began succeeding the west went and saw what is the model there is a total quality management it became a global model we should expand our global global models why in tvs there is no attrition it's also an efficient thing. why in tatas it is not there but it is not there in general motors what's the difference we have to expand the indian ingredient otherwise i told mali we will be doing holding operation thank you very much Yeah, the question from from Vaidishnan or Shastra University. Uh, globally, corporates are getting politicized and politics corporatized. Corporate engagement with political establishment serves both corporate and national interests. 
please compare india versus the world on the present balance between the two and future roadway you see in india corporates have played a very important role in the freedom movement many corporates i know that so indian corporates are sentimentally indian though not organizationally and in the methods that they pursue they are still indian so there is a uh, a political affiliation but you must understand in india politics is not national there is local politics right from the corporations you got to deal with on the all india level so my own feeling is as compared to any westerner the indian businessman is more skilled in handling politicians than anybody in the west it will be there india is a growing uh, nation in various ways and indian businessmen are also trying to understand as i was saying because with many i interact and they find that uh, we have a global role to play this is now informing high end indian businessmen so we have a question from mr raghavan from sri city how can indian corporates address the potential tension between maintaining relations based business practices and complying with international standards and regulations sir this uh, impersonal decision making uh, particularly for instance in banking in client building in corporates it has very serious limitations now the in the impersonal relationships in banks also they have now they are now developing customer relationship i don't know what customer relationship is just going and handing over a bouquet on birthday doesn't build relationship so my view is that you must have local managers with local language local customs this is so at least i don't want to mention the name of one of the important uh, financial firms that built the entire business by leveraging on the local relationships of its managers and its npa is almost nil in karur you go they lend money and every rupee is recovered and there are, there are 2500 private money lenders through whom the banks themselves lend money and sometimes you know i cannot give 50 lakhs the person ask and i form an informal consortium and lend 50 lakhs and i am responsible for collecting that money and giving it to these people this is how relationships work this is not in any way contradicting the contractual or legal obligations unless you want to use relationships for an illegal purpose of course then you can use that even in a contract why only in relations sure thank you next question is from kavi in coimbatore regarding the dichotomy between market society and market economy how can indian businesses strike a balance between embracing market principles while preserving cultural and social values unique to india you see you may have to study many societies for example the entire asian societies have relation based model india is not a unique nation in that sense it is only the western nations which have been able to discard relations and build a society based on contract and so we will have to take the best practices of different nations because we have not looked at the east at all we only talk about look east we don't act east so obviously we have to uh, relate to for example you have you ever sent uh, a successful economy like uh, uh, like uh, korea or uh, thailand or malaysia how do they hand we you are always sending people to at sport or power because you don't look at people who are like you you are looking at people who are unlike you 
and then these questions arise in your mind thank you the next one is from ritish del what role do you see government policies and regulations playing in supporting indian businesses to culturally grounded approaches sir actually my view is the government is no understanding that uh, there is indianness in india previously no government was even recognizing there is indianness in india but unfortunately the government is run by a system of bureaucracy and we have to now think for the government i always advise all people uh, to whom uh, i have advised on not only business on government business relationship you have to think for the government you have to sit on the other side and then remove the cobwebs in the system for example i was involved in some discussions professor mudra was one of them r k swami group was involved in helping me and one of the persons who stood by that was uh, um, uh, rt rt agarajan we all worked we, we had personally nothing to do then mudra scheme was created this is completely out of the way it had nothing to do with market economics also it is certainly nothing to do with market society but it is something which will work in and for india so to convince the government of india of course we could not convince them fully we convinced them 60 70% enormous amount of work had to be put in so we all have to work to make the government understand india because even the government doesn't fully understand india thank you the next one is from sarvanan koimbatur what are the implications of the shift from a western dominated global order to a more multipolar world for indian businesses seeking to expand their international footprint it will be based more on the traditional in fact this has been discussed in the context of uh, india's relationship with uae and uh, and saudi arabia you know these are all countries with whom we had a communal relationship and when we had to send people of the same community to deal with them but it is completely changed it is now leadership to leadership dealing so much so preferring over pakistan saudi arabia is going to have a defense agreement with india and <laughs> if i understood it even deeper the maintenance or the security of the two masjids in saudi arabia which is now with pakistan saudi arabia has been thinking for quite a time to hand it over to the indian army because they feel a neutral army is needed because in pakistan the army we don't know who is the jihadi and who is a soldier so the traditional values of relation building is very very necessary in international uh, diplomacy strategy plays a lesser role where you have relation based approach otherwise everybody you begin to dealing with is strategically and that is what america did strategize the entire relationship now it is becoming more personal yeah thank you uh, the next one is uh, this come on whatsapp from ravi shankar um, how can we get the government institutions to better their infrastructure in terms of libraries hostel that can help us stop the brain drain to the west see the brain drain is bound to take place because there are global opportunities there is no use trying over it you have i know there are many who want to return to india which never happened 20 years back you have got to perform when you perform people will definitely come it is not that people will come for your clean roads and things like that people also come back because there is culture value systems in fact if someone has a girl who is 8 or 9 <laughs> he becomes fidgety in america she wants to come back here otherwise the girl will uh, girl is asked what about don't you have a boyfriend and that uh, you know where it shakes a man 
so you have got to now project the soft power of india which we are we, we even we didn't know about it so now we are beginning to understand it so this balance will come you know there are 45 million chinese outside america and many of the top scientists but they work for china so we must also make india outside india work for india and that is already happening take for instance one of my friends sridhar vembu in fact uh, he calls me his mentor i told him you know his idea ultimately is in the next 5 to 7 years he should emerge as the top 5 6 technology companies in the world that is the goal i said that you should do from india not from new york not even from bombay you should do from a small village and you know the amazing results and their inos r and d is so strong their margin is 40% which is the highest in in uh, it sector and they have not a single rupee loan they have not sold their single share because he said once i show, sell the shares the funds want 40% return 30% return where will i invest in r and d and he has in g6 he has 12000 crores it is possible to run a very successful technology company from govindaperi village because today you have electronic highway everywhere and you don't need national highways thank you the next one is from sabarish selam how do indian corporates navigate geopolitical challenges and changes in the international trade policies which are always pro western see the policies being pro western is history historical uh, uh, continuity for which you know you have got to develop for most of these uh, industry associations have become debating clubs you must make all of them do robust studies in fact uh, if you remember right the when the coimbatore casting units were in huge problem i told them not to look for foreign investment to go and study how chinese are building their uh, casting businesses they found there is a casting unit around which there are 50 houses and the traveling distance between the house and the factory is only 500 meters 200 meters and of course the kind of work the uh, it is demanded from chinese and indian laws you cannot but they say it is 24 hours the kiln will burn so you have got to go and study how it is on that basis you but it all depends upon sharing the best experiences of the most successful people who are not necess- the west has become too lazy i can tell you once they have begun enjoying tourism the society will die <laughs> we'll take one last question sir uh, this is from ms priya pondicherry what strategies can indian corporates employ to remain competitive in a rapidly changing global market see it is it has to be an industry specific question there is nothing like uh, a view which is applicable to all businesses for example i i talk about it if it companies want to conquer the world they must move away from metropolis because the biggest cost in it businesses is the real estate cost the land cost the moment you move away from the city to some dindukal or some other place your cost becomes half that much your and the fellows whom we employ here they actually come from those places <laughs> and the first thing they lose is the house they are living in the house 20 30 kilometers they can come by a scooter they are doing it i am seeing it because our mind is cosmopolitan we cannot cease to be cosmopolitan we have got to cease to be cosmopolitan to become competitive 
i think it is industry specific practice that is uh, a must if we have to establish a global level competence thank you sir group captain thank you so much sir your dear viewers we have so many questions to uh, pass your time not able to talk about the questions ladies and gentlemen what a fascinating evening can keep going but we have to stop it uh, everything is got a scheduled program i think you are a very warm round of applause for a billion billion of our people let us remark a bit of a forward with our representative manager one moment Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for your presence and. Uh,